tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. Glad you braved the cold to come and join me. You're probably wondering why it's so chilly down here, at Casa de Blood of all places. Well, I've got a pretty good idea why that might be. Come on in and have a seat. Forget cuddling, Chester. Aren't you cold anyway? Damn mollusks. Hang tight, friend. I'll only be a second. Oh yeah, that's always better. You know, I heard they spray tobacco fields with radioactive runoff. Something about population control or whatever. <sighs> Whew. Well, I don't believe a word of it, because the way I see it, that wouldn't be very nice at all. So smoke them if you got them, and drink those glasses to the bottom, friends. Because this looks like a job for old Drew Blood. <laughs> you know, this is season one, episode 16 of Drew Blood. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. <laughs> if you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad free versions of this and all our episodes, as well as tells all the way back from 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click patrons in the upper menu. You'll get instant access from our friends at Children Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. And say, you got a story or two you'd like to hear on the show? Send it to TrueBloodHorror at gmail.com. If so, if so, if accepted, you'll be radiated from coast to coast. Not irradiated, just radiated. Maybe broadcasted is a better word. Thank God you pulled me over, Ossifer. I could have killed someone. Just, just thank you. <laughs> mm. The cold winds bloweth from the north, from all the way up in Nova Scotia, where the hoofbeats of the majestic moose echo through the snow-capped mountains where polar bears and Eskimos set aside their differences and clutch each other by their dwindling campfires only to survive the night. That's right, we've got a tale from weird fiction standout Steve Vernon, the first in a two-book series of comic noir featuring his pseudo-superhero, Captain Nothing. Man, how cold is it up in Nova Scotia anyway? Hmm, 41 degrees today. Well, maybe I exaggerated a little bit, but it sure ain't bikini weather. In any case, from author Steve Vernon, I give you the glint of moonlight on broken glass. It's midnight in the hard part of town. The mask is itching like it always does. The ragged end of my cape is soaking in a puddle of something I don't want to guess about. I'm crouched behind the kicked-in aluminum trash can. It stinks of rotted meat and drunkard's piss, and I feel right at home. As I watch the two of them drag the woman into the alley, I wait until they've got her dress hoisted up and her panties squirmed down. I wait until I'm certain that one of them has his pants unbuckled and is firmly into her, bearing down hard. Hey, I may wear a cape, but that doesn't make me a hero. So I come up behind the one who is standing and watching. He's the easiest to take, the smaller of the two. He has to wait his turn. I don't keep him waiting, and he doesn't hear me coming. 
He's too busy filling his eyes with the sight of her tits and his buddy's ass slapping up and down. Too busy filling his ears full of her screams. I'm glad she is screaming. It makes it easier for me to sneak up on the three of them. There isn't much danger of her screams bringing anyone else. Not in this part of town, where people mostly keep to their own misery. Too busy to bother with anyone else's. I can see her face, sharp in the moonlight and the filter of alley dreams. I can see the anger and fear, transforming and transfiguring her from a housewife hurrying home from shopping to a harridan of hatred and hunger. She wants to be larger. She wants to turn herself into a she cone, no matter what the price, just long enough to shred these piss ants into puddles of lukewarm gravy. So I popped a peeper with a half a brick, hard enough to open the back of his skull and let the wet stuff out. The peeper drops like he isn't getting up on this side of forever. The other guy sees me now because the peeper is falling face first onto the other guy's ass. The other guy gets busy trying to pull himself free from the woman and the peeper's dead weight. I have to give her credit. She's hanging on to the other guy like he's her long lost lover. She's showing him the tiger hiding behind the pussy, keeping him tied down, counting on me to finish him off. She's still screaming, only the screams have turned into something else. They're painted with the sound of revenge. Like she knows she's going to get him. Like she'd rip his throat open with her teeth if she gets the chance. I'm a gentleman, so I don't make her wait for that. I cloud him hard while he's turning. <coughs> I catch him with the half a brick on his lower jaw, leaving it angling open like a switch-bladed bike tire. So now he's making some really interesting sounds through that half-flattened mouth of his. It makes a nice counterpoint to the woman's screams. I finish him off with a couple more swings. It takes a few because I can't get a square crack at him. She's jiggling him way too fast. Then she's up and on him ripping at him with her fingernails, kicking him, and biting his ear and nose and anything else that's hanging loose. He's way past dead, but she isn't done with him yet. I let her go at it for another minute or two. Call it catharsis. It's a better medicine than a thousand rosaries worth of prayer. Then finally I tell her, that's enough. But she keeps tearing at him, her face twisting like nothing I've ever seen before. I grab at her. It's like grabbing an armload of electric eels. This is what it does to you sometimes. It's a hunger. Something that needs to be fed. Something that needs to be fed a whole lot. Kill him. She says. I want to kill him. He's dead, lady. He's dead. They're both dead. Dead, done, and gone. <laughs> Kill them again! She shouts, yanking herself free from me. It should have been funny, but it wasn't. I give her another minute to tire herself out, but I could be wasting my time. She's tearing at him like she wants to undress his skin from his bones. There isn't too much left of him that isn't cut, torn, or bruised. Finally, I drag her off of him. Look, lady, they're dead. Both of them. And they deserved it. They'd raped three other women in the last month. Those were the ones I knew about. There might have been others. They weren't too polite about leaving any open mouths behind them. Who the hell are you? What's with the cape? I'm a superhero, I say, planting my fists on my hips and throwing my chest out with my best heroic smile. You can call me Captain Nothing. Okay, so Captain Nothing isn't really my real name. It's just another mask I wear. I figure it beats the hell out of the human fly trap or the amazing wonder bra. Sometimes a little nothing is better than nothing at all. She straightens her dress. I do my best to look away. Nobody likes to have their secrets stared at. Her panties are torn and bloodied. She tears the panties off like they were a part of a bad memory and then she flings them aside. They drop unceremoniously across her rapist's dead face, like a dirty veil. Nice. I heard you screaming, I continue. 
I got here just as quick as I could. It's a bit of a lie, but sometimes the truth just begs to be stretched. Only she isn't listening. She's still making that face, eyes darting left and right, like she's looking for a scalping knife or a rock. I grabbed a half a brick and discreetly tuck it into my pocket. After all, I wouldn't want her to get any ideas. Besides, it's a handy tool to have in your pocket. I know, I know, Batman's got a utility belt. Me, I've just got pockets, black denim, denim for the toughness, black for the mystery. Besides, black denim doesn't show blood stains. Only she isn't finished though. She throws herself back down on the corpse. Now she's trying to choke him out. There's a soft spot in the human throat. She finds it. It takes some doing, but she digs at it until she's poked one of her thumbs through it. Then she starts rooting around. There's an ugly wet socketing sound, like she's fucking his throat. I drag her off him a second time. He's dead, lady, I tell her. He's way past dead. They're both dead and goodbye gone. It isn't exactly classical elocution, but it's all I can think to say. She keeps on struggling, her eyes rolling around in her sockets like they are trying to escape from her face. Then she pulls free and makes a run for it. I grab for her, but all I manage to snag is her purse. One of those long, strappy things that hangs across her shoulder. I stare at the purse in my hands, wondering what the hell I ought to do with it. Then she's gone into the darkness. She'll probably be okay. She'll probably find herself some cop and they'll check her into the hospital to sleep it off. That's when I hear the scream. Actually, it's more than a scream. It's more like something being pulled out of her, yanked and uprooted. I've got a bad feeling about this. So I run like my feet have suddenly grown anvils, the purse rattling against my side like a bag full of hammers. In the moonlight, I must look like the world's ugliest drag queen, Kate Purse and all. I don't care what I look like. She needs saving. And by the time I get there, the screaming has stopped. She's lying in the mouth of the alleyway, wreathed in the halo of a sodium lamp, something dark that is pulling around her, moonlight glinting on a fresco of broken glass. And there are pieces of her, there and there and there. Her face looks like it was skinned alive, like something had torn its way through her and out of her. I turn and puke. It sops into the thirsty concrete. As I look up, I catch a movement in the shadow. I swallow, my mouth still reeking of puke, and pure pissed off, I run toward the movement, trying to catch a better look, and that's when I see what did it to her. What cut her up so quick and so bad moving like it was folding itself into itself. I see what it is, only I don't have a name for what I see. I throw the half a brick, but I might as well be throwing a spitball. Shattering glass shouts into the night. Shit, I've broken someone's window. Then I hear a laugh. Like a barber's scissors dancing with wet scalpels. The kind of laugh a straight razor might make wickering through a soft young throat. It wasn't a window I broke. It was something else. Something I broke that didn't stop moving. I'm after whatever the hell it is like a greyhound after an electric jackrabbit. Now it's climbing a fire escape, shimmering in the moonlight. I keep running. I'm not going to let it get away that easily. I jump and grab the first rung, afraid I'm going to tangle my cape or her purse. <coughs> Shit, my hand slice open on the rung. Blood streaming down my palm, mixing with the dirt and the rust. It is as if the rusty iron has been powdered with double sharp glass. I try to hang in there and pull myself up but whatever it is on the rung starts eating and burning into my cuts like I'm hanging on to a handful of piranha blood, galloping leprosy, and raw sulfuric acid. So I drop. 
I hit the pavement on my knees. It's lucky I don't break them. I wonder if Batman wears knee pads. No, his butler probably runs around with a tiny bat net to catch him when he falls. I look up, but all I can see is the trickle of my blood slickering down over the rusty iron fire escape run. There's glass all around me and blood on the glass. It's mine, but not all of it. I don't know how I can tell, but I know it's not all mine. So I get up. I want to hit something, but I know it wouldn't do any good. I could go into any bar in town and knock somebody down. I mean, anybody. I could do it. I'm big. I make a living knocking people down, but it wouldn't do any good. It wouldn't bring her back. I open her purse and I fumble through it. There's some money. I cram that in my pocket with the half a brick. The superhero business pays less than a lifetime of squeegee and broken car windows. There's also a business card. It figures. There has to be a business card. Women like her don't leave home without them. It's their stamp of authenticity, their personal sense of identity, just like the leather of my mask. So I pull out the card and have a long look at it. She was a psychiatrist, and her name was Sharn. The blood on the card is mostly mine. Spider-Man's got a Soho loft. Superman's got a condo in the Arctic. Me? I've got a one-room apartment where the herds of nameless cockroaches scuttle along the walls like an army of vagrant hieroglyphics. I stare out the window, the only view I've got. Sometimes I get the jukebox of a wino singing off-key. Sometimes a concert of three or four. There are also the inevitable alley cats screeching for cheap sex and rats that hardly make a sound at all. My reflection is looking back at me from the window. The reflection taints the color of the glass that hasn't been cleaned since Satan first pushed the apple. A cobweb trails messily in the window's corner. It makes a neat little fuzzy pup tent. The coffins of small flies are bound softly in the web. There has to be a spider up there, but I never actually see him. Maybe he's got a day job. Tell me who did it, I asked the invisible spider. Who killed her? Only spiders can't talk, not even the invisible kind. And besides, I already know just who did it. I know what did it. So I stare at my reflection, filtered through the cobwebs and dirty glass. I don't like what I see. That's one of the reasons I learned to wear a mask. Forget about secret identity. After a while, you don't have any identity at all. I'm Captain Nothing, and nothing more than that. I'm wearing the mask even now. It itches and smells because I wear it all the time these days. I've got a secret hidden under it. Not just a secret identity. Hell, if anyone knew who I was, they probably wouldn't even care. No, this is a secret like nobody else has got, right under my mask. I stare at my reflection. How the hell did I wind up like this? Wearing a mask and a cape in a room that even the cockroaches are afraid to settle down in. Were my parents killed by a criminal? Was I the last son of a dying planet? Buggered by a trio of randied out space dorks with a radioactive anal probe? None of these things. I just had a temper was all. And seeing what was wrong with this world pissed me off even worse. Call it job preference. I didn't have the temperament to be a cop. Too damn much temper to make it through the academy. I belted my police instructor halfway through the first week. They sent me to a counselor. I belted him too. Oh, we talked for a while before I belted him. I can't remember a damn thing he said, mind you. I tried to make a living as a private eye, but it turned out I didn't like bourbon and I never cared for guns. I also had no patience for snooping, so I figured I'd give the superhero business a try. Call it a lateral career move. What the hell? I like the hours. So what if I don't have any superpowers? You don't really need a superpower. 
That's just so much window dressing. All you need for this gig is a judgmental nature and an attitude the size of Godzilla's pancreas. I slide her business card behind the tenting of the invisible spider's cobweb. Eat that, I say. Then I lie down on my cot and I call it a night. The next morning I call the number on her card. I use a payphone six blocks from where I live. Mine has never been connected. I've already checked the newspaper. There wasn't much said about a mutilated body or even the two rapists. A bulldog that placed third in a dog show took the front page. It was a slow news day, I guess. So I stood there, framed within the glass of the phone booth. The morning sun turns the booth into an easy bake oven, so I keep the door kicked open with my foot. Somebody picks up on the third ring but doesn't answer. I wait. Nothing. Not even breathing. I think about screaming into the phone receiver, maybe asking if their fridge is running or if they've got a Prince Albert in the can. Finally, I speak. <clears throat> is Sharon there? A voice, too sharp to be human, answers. Speaking. Then I hear it, starting slow and building like an air hammer in a radiator. I hear the laughter, the scalpels dancing with razor blades, all neat and icy and steady like it isn't going to stop. Whatever's on the other end of the line sure isn't Sharon Glass. Listen, I say. Then I smash the receiver through the telephone booth glass. It hits hard, and for a moment I stand there. Pieces of glass fall in like slow-motion frozen rain. I leave before someone thinks to call the cops. I could wait for one to arrive, I suppose. Maybe I should make a report to them, but what would I say? Should I tell them that Sharon Glass actually answered her phone? I might as well report a missing newspaper. The Green Hornet had black beauty. The Lone Ranger had silver. I have a yellow cab. It's a good cab. It hasn't been barfed in and the driver doesn't smoke. I think he even speaks English. Not that I can be choosy. It's pretty hard to flag down anything in a mask and a cape. So I give the cabbie the address from the business card. It takes them less than 10 minutes to get there. The traffic is good and I don't look like I can afford any scenic detours. Her office is in the plush side of town. The doorman doesn't want to let me in, but when I tell him that I'm here for sharing glass, he steps aside. I guess he figures I'm one of her patients. I take the elevator up. It's nice not having to climb stairs or fire escapes. She has a receptionist. She must have been doing really well. Or perhaps she just wanted folks to think that she was. Uh, I'm here to see Dr. Glass. The receptionist is nice looking if you go for that polished mannequin look. A good figure, nice complexion. She probably spends a lot of time at the gymnasium and the day spa. Are you her receptionist? I ask. I'm Hurrigan, the supervisor. That's a new one. Folks are inventing masks all the time. Well, Madam Supervisor, I'm here to see Dr. Glass. I use Shern's title, because people usually listen a little harder if you squeeze in those little notches of respect. She looks at me like you might look at a stray dog wet from a rainstorm. I throw her my best disarming grin, but I might as well have been throwing soap bubbles. She's with the patient right now. She sure is. I look at her closed office door. I think about all the guts that have been spilled behind that proper looking slab of highly polished mahogany veneer. Do you have an appointment? She knows I don't. She's just being officiously polite. Sure I do. Just look under the hard seas for Captain Nothing. She gives me a pretty good look. Like she might have a chuckle buried somewhere deep beneath that polyester facade. Nothing. There's a big yellow sheet on her desk, gritted out like you might keep sports statistics on it. It must be an agenda. It's good to see people are still killing trees instead of relying strictly upon computers. I don't see your name, she begins to say. 
Are you sure you're spelling Captain right? I asked. While she's looking down at her officious yellow roster, I vault her desk. It would have been a whole lot easier to just step around the desk, but not nearly as impressive. If in doubt, mesmerize them with gusto is my motto. It works for nearly two and a half seconds. Then she stops being mesmerized and grabs for the phone. But by then, I've already yanked the phone from the wall. It's old-fashioned, one of those receiver-style phones. I didn't think they made them anymore. What now? Tie her up? Gag her with the scarf? I'm still debating this when she catches me with a thumb in my throat. <laughs> they must offer classes in street brawling and self-defense at her day spa. I grab my throat, hacking up a wet and lousy tasting loogie, while doing my best to show her she hasn't hurt me. She goes for my eyes next, her hands held out like one of those little rakes you use on weeds. I catch her by the shoulder and shove her as gently as I can against the door. Twice. Hey, she hit me hard. She makes a nice banging sound against the back of the door. That'll do for a knock. Before she can make me look any worse, I reach around her and turn the doorknob. The door swings in and she and I go spilling onto the floor. She breaks my fall with a kindly knee to the groin. Thank God I'm wearing my standard issue super cup. I pull myself free and Madam Supervisor stops trying to maim me. She's too busy screaming at the thing she thought was her employer. What used to be Sharn Glass. It's kneeling there by a stylish green couch, attending to her patient. The eyes are the mirrors of the soul, and whatever used to be Shiring Glass is busy gnawing on her patient's mirrors. It's funny just how chewy she makes them look, like big tough skin grapes. The red of the woman's blood is blended nicely with the green of the couch. Combined, they make a lovely shade of copper brown. She's talking while she's eating. I guess her mother never guilted her too hard about proper table manners. You've got to forgive yourself, she says, then takes another munch. Just let the hatred go. I can't believe it. She's making like Oprah and Hannibal Lecter rolled up into a completely unviable combination. Only the woman seems to be listening. I can't believe it through all the pain she must be feeling. All she can see is a sheet of sticky red agony, and she's nodding and listening like the good doctor is pumping her full of high-test Valium. Then I get it. Sharon Glass didn't die in that alley. She was reborn. All the latent anger and frustration piled up behind the vinyl siding, and her Maybelline facade broke free and broke down, turning her into something made of sheer hate and glass that can break and break and never stop breaking. And cutting. She's very good at cutting. Every super nightmare is supposed to have a name. So in my mind, I think of her as Shatter Sharon. She's cracked up, broken down. She shattered every mask and metaphor that civilization hides behind. There's nothing left here but raw, undeniable hunger. Only it's not the eyes that she's eaten, but whatever hateful thing the woman's seen. She's eaten the rage, the frustration, the anger. Hell, look at it one way and she's practically performing a public service. Only she's killing the patient with the cure. The receptionist is still screaming. She's got a lot of lung power. She must do cardio in between the self-defense classes. Get out of here, I yell. I give her a push towards the door. It's kind of like trying to push a sock drawer full of electrocuting snakes. She keeps yelling, as if somehow creating the proper decibel level is going to make some kind of sense out of this gentle massacre. I keep pushing her towards the door. Go yell for the police, I suggest. That last word seems to get through to her. She scuttles for the door like a crab heading for high water. That's one down. Now for the main course. I turn around. Shatter Sharon is still talking to her patient. Only the lady is probably having a hard time hearing much of anything. Shatter Sharon's worked her way through the eyes and has gotten down into the brain. 
She takes the ears in like they were made of corn. My guess, from the looks of it, is that Shatter Sharon's teeth have raked their way somewhere down past her patient's left sinus cavity for a little post-nasal therapy. Can we talk about this? I ask. Okay, she might be listening. She's walking towards me like she might want to communicate, or at least open her mouth. I'm hearing that laughter again. It's like a pair of barber scissors working right behind my left ear. Come on, let's have a little dialogue, I suggest. I figure I've got two options. One of them is spelled right, and the other's read left. Only you should never lead with the right. So I take a swing at her with my left, backhanded, because I don't want to hurt her too much. She's still a woman, I think. Only I ought not to think so hard. My backhand hits something that gives way like sharp water, like hitting a stucco wall made out of jellyfish and moon pies. It is hot and sharp and burning all at the same time. I look at what's left of the hand. I see lots of blood and lots of skinned meat. That white thing that looks like a knuckle bone? That's just an overboiled eggshell left over from the receptionist brown bag lunch, I hope. Shatter Sharon is coming closer, sounding like a rain of no deposit pop bottles. The words are crashing out of her mouth and shattering my every hope and dream. She's speaking, only it's like watching a ventriloquist act. The words don't seem to be coming out of her mouth. Her lips are moving, sure. They're articulating. They're chattering and chopping like a runaway guillotine, not even bothering to try and form themselves around the words that leak out of her skin. Just let it out, she says. Let's get down to the bones of it. Uh-oh. She wants to chew the fat, meaning my fat. The best I can do is pray that she's allergic to nothing. The root of your problem, the heart of your guilt. The words spilling out like so many smarties from a fat man's lips. Your rage, your anger, your frustration. Let me taste it. So I hit her again. It's stupid, I know, but I can't think of anything better to do. I bring it in low, aiming for something that I hope is soft. My arm passes right through. It feels like it's sticking elbow deep in a screaming hornet's nest. Did you ever try to fight depression? Did you ever try to lash out at your temper? It's like trying to drown a river in a bucket of ocean. All of her rage, her fear, her self-loathing, it shatters out around my right arm, cutting it down to muscle tissue and reforming itself just as quick as that. I'm down on my knees in front of her, only not in a nice kind of way. She's standing over me, her mouth and teeth working like a double-time trip hammer, and all of those thousand mouths of brittle glass are laughing down at me, the laughter cutting my ears like a scorpion flail. That does it. Nobody laughs at Captain Nothing. I look around her office, the diploma hiding behind the glass, the leather-covered, blood-splattered couch, the wallpaper stained with pain and unleashed memories. And I ask myself what Dr. Phil would do. I stand up. I'm not sure how I do that, but I manage. Her laughter is like burning piss, shrieking napalm, eating away at my soul. What the hell can I do? I don't have an answer. I'm beat, and I know it. I've got about half a second to think like the psychiatrist Shatter Sharon used to be. So I open my arms wide, like I want to kiss and make up. Come here and give me a hug, I tell her. Let old Captain Nothing make it all better and gone. And she comes at me, unable to stop herself. I have half a heartbeat to think to myself that this is probably the worst idea I've had since I first left the wound. And then she's in my arms. I feel pain crawling through my flesh and maybe even my soul. It's a pain worse than napalm. It's a pain worse than castration. It's a pain worse than self-inflicted guilt. I'm hanging on to her, feeling her eating at me. 
All of her broken dreams and fractured reality, her shattered perceptions and breached walls, the incisive comments casually dealt, the slices of life that separate each of us from what we want to be, the blind dividing cleaver of love striking at random, her fragmented family torn and uprooted since birth, the dysfunctional disjunction of society and the casual vivisection of an impartial society grown blind to communal agony. Come on, I coax her. Let it all out. Now she's cutting and tearing at me, and I'm taking it all in like I was just one big sponge of self-mutilation. Cut me, baby. I like it. I feel my clothes giving way. The cape and the denim and my favorite Coors t-shirt. I feel the patchwork of my skin lacerating and letting go. Her screams, my screams, bleeding about my ears. And I'm hanging on and letting it flow. Finally, she lets go of it all. That hatred that's been topping her tank. That hate that's been keeping her juices flowing long after she let Papa Despair have his way. Now she is nothing more than a woman kneeling on a blood-stained carpet and the only thing that's hitting the ground are her tears. God damn them. Those dirty bastards. God damn them all. I feel her frustration breaking free. I feel her letting go of all the hatred. All of that polite anger that she'd kept walled up behind that high society smile. It hurts. It probably hurts like hell. Only it's a good kind of hurt. She lets it all out into the night and the anonymous acceptance of the city. That's the one gift of concrete and civilization. Listen, there's a secret hiding behind every window in this goddamn city. Every voice, every whisper. They're all out there hiding behind a million sheets of glass. It's the light that keeps them hidden. In the darkness, you can see right through their masquerade. Every detail shining through in raw crystal sheets of pain. And Sharon Glass is filling it all. Now I hear the police coming through the door. Dozens of them, like big blue army ants scrabbling in. And all they see is this big naked blood-stained guy in a mask standing over a weeping PhD and a woman with half a skull. Let's go up against the wall, move! You heard him, get out of there now! Get your hands up! I feel the cold cuffs about my wrist bones and it kind of takes some of the sting out of it. I'm looking down at Sharon Glass, hoping she hasn't broken down too much to remember to tell these officers of the law that I'm one of the good guys. Then one of them reaches for my mask. Jesus! He swears. I've got to grin at that. Sweet Jesus! I mean, it's so goddamn funny. The fucking thing is stitched to his face! Just wait until they get the mask off and get down to the tattoo. You've been listening to The Glint of Moonlight on Broken Glass by Steve Vernon. You know, Steve Vernon is a guy who you can kind of imagine what he's drinking while he's writing any given story. This one in particular, I've got my money on bourbon in a coffee mug. Have you read Plague Monkey Spam? I'm guessing with that one he was drinking radioactive runoff. Bookgasm guesses, if Harlan Ellison, Richard Matheson, and Robert Blotch had a three-way sex romp in a hot tub, and then a team of scientists came in and filtered out the water and mixed the leftover DNA into a test tube, the resulting genetic experiment would most likely grow up into Steve Vernon. I don't know how they talked those three into it, but as far as I know, this claim remains undisputed. You can find Steve Vernon's blog at stevevernonstoryteller.wordpress.com and follow him on Facebook or on Twitter at Stephen Vernon. For his excellent novels and short story collections, look him up on Amazon and audible.com. If you've enjoyed this story, I've got good news for you. Two volumes of The Adventures of Captain Nothing are available on Amazon and audible.com. 
called Nothing to Lose and Nothing Down. They're both a lot of fun, and all proceeds go to keeping Steve warm. Grab a book, won't you? You can be a superhero of sorts yourself. And while you're saving the world from the forces of evil, please remember to stop by our iTunes page or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It helps more than you might think. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating all the way back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. I want to thank you all for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. And friends, I'd really love to keep doing this for y'all. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram. So stop on by and say hi, friends. Well, friend, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next time. So grab a drink for the road, throw on a cape, and go save the universe. And now that you've received your directive, may the wind be at your back. May the road rise up to meet you. And remember, this whole business about the tobacco fields, it's probably the same rockmen trying to destroy the nuclear core of Mercury. The world needs a hero, and it might as well be your ass, cause no one else is gonna do it. Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.